Today we're changing our gears a little bit. I want to talk about the power to serve. And in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 5, it says, John, this is John the Baptist, John baptized with water. But in just a few days, and this is Jesus talking, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Hmm. There's a baptism in water and there's a baptism with the Holy Spirit. And then verse 8, he kind of clarifies this a little bit. Expounds upon just a wee bit <clears throat> what it's all about. He says in verse 8, but, and this is Jesus talking, but when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power. Mm, some of you got it. <laughs> Let's read it once again. But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power. Getting better. Let's try one more time. But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power. And that word, again, is dunamis in the Greek, which means dynamite. It means an explosive, not a, um, not a destructive explosive, but a constructive explosive that empowers us to do what he has created us to do. So he says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power and You'll tell people all about me. Jesus is talking. You'll tell people all about me everywhere. And you'll start off in Jerusalem. That's where they were at. Throughout Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. The power to serve is given to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. I jotted a couple of thoughts in here I didn't want to forget. But young men and women need power to keep free from the passions that will corrupt and ruin them. Power to stay clean. Power to resist temptation. How we need the power from on high to stop. Broken marriages, broken hearts, broken dreams. We need power to close our eyes instinctively to the sinful and seductive sights in this world. You know, where all of a sudden there's something that would tempt us it's kind of like bait on the trap. We would instinctively, not in our own human strength because we fail there, but we would close our eyes or we would turn away from looking at things that would hurt us, that would trap us. We need power to pull down the pictures from the walls of our imaginations that we would never expose on the walls of our homes. And the enemy of our soul would have us looking at these things in our mind that nobody else knows about. But we would never take those same pictures and hang them on the walls of our home. It would be inappropriate. We all need this power to serve, you know, and to do God's will. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 says, it says, And no doubt you know that God, he anointed, God the Father anointed Jesus, his son, Jesus of Nazareth. He anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. power. Yes, okay. Don't forget that now, all right? But when you see the Holy Spirit in the Bible, often you see it associate power with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a he, you know. It's not an it, you know. And we receive the Holy Spirit and power in our lives because God has given us tasks to do. He's created us with a purpose. And it says, and no doubt you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around. Then after Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, it says then, not before, then Jesus went around doing good and healing most who were, I'm sorry, all, all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. And he set an example <clears throat> for you and I to follow. Now, this next verse is, uh, I'm sure you've read them before. It just seems to be like, wow, this is like crazy. Wow. John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus is still talking. He says, the truth, we would expect him to tell nothing but 
The truth is, anyone, and that's referring to all of you who are here and who are listening, the truth is, anyone who believes in me, this is Jesus talking, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. Now, is that crazy or what? Have you ever read your Bible? Have you seen the works that Jesus did? Jesus says the truth is anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Now, there may be some people who hear this and they go like, I don't believe that. And therefore, that's okay. You will never do the greater works. You'll never even do the same works that Jesus did because it was conditional. He said, and this is the truth, anyone who does what? Believes in me will do the same works I've done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. You know, all the things that God has, you know, created you for and, and the purposes he has for you is to continue on like Jesus did. And Jesus said the same works and greater works if you believe. And that's so important that we take his word to heart and we believe. Then he picks up in verse 13. Jesus is still talking. He says, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Because the work of the son brings glory to the father. Yes, ask anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, obey my commandments. Verse 16 says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor who will never leave. Now, he says another counselor. See, when Jesus was here and he traveled with the disciples and all the people who followed him, he counseled them, he comforted them, he ministered to every need. But Jesus knew that once he was crucified, you know, and risen from the dead, he would ascend to be with the Father. Y'all hear a siren off in the distance? Well, Father, we do ask you for a miracle right now. We don't know what's going on. Apparently someone's in need, and we ask that you'd help all the first responders, Lord, to be able to assist those who are in great need and meet their needs. And, Lord, draw the people in need and those who are responding, draw them to the place of trusting you as their Savior. Lord, bless them. Maybe somebody we know. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Jesus said, I'm going to ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. I'm not going to be here, but I'm going to give you another counselor, just like me, and he'll never leave you. That's what he says. And then he qualifies it in verse 17, and he says, he is the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world at large cannot receive him. Just the secular world out there cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him. Are you looking for the Holy Spirit that Jesus says is the counselor who will be with you every step of the way, always, forever? Because Jesus ascended to the Father. And God is with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And when he comes into our life, he empowers us with explosive, constructive power to be what God has called you to be. You'll be the best husband. You'll be the best father. You'll be the best mother. You'll be the best wife. You'll be the best worker or the best employer or, or, or whatever it is. He brings power into our lives, enable us to do what we have been created and called to do. That's what he says. Let me read it again. Verse 17. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world at large cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him. And my question was, are you looking for him? And is, the world isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you do. Because he lives with you now and later will be where? In you. In you. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, the Holy Spirit worked in people, but a little bit different. But after the, re the crucifixion and the resurrection, the Holy Spirit was given as a counselor, you know, 
as a comforter, as an empower to all who believe. He came upon Samson, and Samson killed a lion with his bare hands, and he came upon David, and David killed a Goliath with a sling. And we saw the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. You know, as he was saying, here, he lives with you, but now he'll live in you. That's what he's talking about here. There's an old song we used to sing, uh, and it's basically the scripture in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, and it says, It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, you know. Now, have you ever did a little kayaking or a little canoeing or a little rowing in a, a rowboat? Anybody ever done that? Most of us have. How is that? Good. What if you have to do a thousand miles? Well, it might be a lot of work. There may be a better way. Everybody, anybody, ever been in a sailboat? Well, I wish I had a mighty Russian wind, a storm up here. I could demonstrate that. Oh, maybe I have. <laughs> now, whoops. <clears throat> now, I don't know if you've ever had to contend with Like a tornado wind, hurricane wind. But if we learn, and we'll just call this a repentance, which means an about face, and we surrender and choose to run like a sailboat would do, run with the wind and allow the wind to fill your sails. Oh, wow, this is easy. Oh, wow, this is easier than paddling, you know? Oh, wow, there's a power there if you have a sail. And I'll tell you something, when it comes to working with the Holy Spirit, all he's looking for us is to stop resisting him. If you find yourself in real difficulty in life, it's like, man, it's just hard. Maybe you're resisting the Holy Spirit, what he's trying to do in your life, what he created you for, and if we'll resist, you know, stop resisting his power and his moving, and we will surrender. And, and you know, this is hoisting the main sail and surrendering to Almighty God. And as we hoist the sails, we catch the wind, and we're standing in the wind, and then he empowers us to do what he created us to do. It's not by our might, it's not by our paddling anymore, it's not by our might or our power, but it's by the spirit of almighty God. And there's a significant difference between you doing something and God doing something. You, you remember when uh, Joshua... He took all the people and they marched around the walls of Jericho. They didn't have picks, pickaxes and sledgehammers to knock those walls down. Not by might or by power, but it's by my spirit. The Holy Spirit caused all those walls to fall down flat. As Joshua and all the people blew the, the, the trumpets and they shouted at the exact time God had instructed them to do so. So we can do things in our own human strength. And we really fall so far short. But if we'll access the power that comes along with the Holy Spirit in our life and not resist Him, you know, not resist Him, you'll find that life becomes so much easier as far as, you know, you find this amazing power that empowers you to do what you were created to do. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 2, it says... Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. Can y'all understand what that windstorm was kind of like? Just in case you can't, I'm going to try to help you a little bit. Okay. Can y'all feel it yet? You do? Should I bring it closer? Oh, there goes somebody's wig. Oh, did you grab that? Season, guys. Whoa, no! 
There goes somebody's notes. Ah. Okay, that just means I got to start over from scratch, okay? Thank you. I only have 14 pages. What's that? Oh, they're not. Thank you, dear. Let me see here. What comes after three? Okay, that would be four. And then that would be five. Dear, they were in order. Yes, they were. That's awesome. See, that's where you get a helpmate so she can keep your notes in order. Hmm. Let's stay over that away. Okay. Boy, that didn't happen in any of the other services. Hmm. Got a little careless here, I reckon. But it says that there was a roaring, mighty windstorm in the skies above, and it filled. That's in verse 2 of Acts 2. And it filled the house where they were meeting. Hmm. You know, there's an old song we used to sing years ago. It's called, it, was, uh, it went, fill me up, Holy Spirit, overflow for all to see. That I am a new person because you live in me. It's kind of like the 23rd Psalm. My cup runneth over. Fill me up. Because, see, the Holy Spirit is so big and powerful, if he fills us up, he's going to overflow. There's not room enough in us to contain him all. That's for sure. In verse 38 here in Acts 2, 38, it says, Peter replied. Now, you got to understand Peter. Peter was that guy right before Jesus was crucified. You know, they took Jesus and they were interrogating him. And Peter was outside the building. They had a little campfire there. There was a maiden there. Peter was there with all the other people who was milling around, warming himself at the fire. And the little maid said to Peter, said, you were one of those disciples. Yeah, I, I saw you with Jesus. You remember what Peter did? He swore. He cursed. And he says, you're wrong. You're mistaken. I don't know the man. You remember that? He was a coward. But after Jesus was crucified, and it was just a few days after Jesus was crucified, and then he had risen from the dead, that the Holy Spirit was poured out. And listen here. It says in verse 38, Peter replied. Hmm. Peter replied, each of you must turn from your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Now, that was accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, turning from your sins, repentance and all. And then he's talking about and being baptized, you know, in water. And then he says, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit cannot be seized. Like, I got a hold of it. I'll control this power for my life. And, and there's a place in, in the book of Acts where Simeon, this guy offered the disciples money. Hey, give me the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll pay you for it. He cannot be seized, but he can be received as Peter had received the Holy Spirit. And then it says in verse 39, this promise of the Holy Spirit, it's not just with salvation after we accept Christ. It's the time when we genuinely surrender and yield and allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. It says this promise is to you and to your children. And even to the Gentiles, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Would you like your children to have power to resist the temptations of this world? Would you like your children to have the power to become everything that God had created them to be? To reach their full potential? The Holy Spirit is given for us and for our children. And then he says in, in Acts chapter 4 verse 7, they brought in the two disciples and demanded... Now, these two disciples had healed people, restored people. A guy was lame, you know. They were working miraculous things. They were doing the greater works that Jesus said they would be doing after they received the Holy Spirit. And it says in Acts 4, 7, they brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? And I'm sure the disciples were saying, I'm glad you asked that question. And then, it says in verse 8, then Peter, same guy who denied he knew Jesus, you know, about a month ago, denied him. And then Peter, 
filled with the Holy Spirit, who was a coward earlier, even to a, a little maid standing by the campfire. He was a coward. He's no coward no longer. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, leaders and elders of our nation. What had happened, this powerless man had hoisted the mainsail. I might divert that air over here. So. Had hoisted his mainsail, had surrendered to Almighty God, and had received the power of God. This is Peter we're talking about here. And it says, they brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Verse 8 says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to the leaders and elders of our nation, are we being questioned because, of, because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Are you questioning us because we healed a crippled man? This is what religion does. Or you can't do it that way. And you can't have people carrying their old mat home on the Sabbath. That's against, you know what? They didn't care about the man, whether he's healed or not. They were trying to keep all the little details of the law. Are we being questioned because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Well, let me clearly state to you, clearly state to you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed in the name and power of Jesus Christ from Nazareth, the man you crucified. Do you know the dead man? He ain't dead no more. It goes on to say here, but whom God raised from the dead. Do you remember, uh, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but when I was a, a, a child, my mom and dad took us all over the nation. We went way out west. Had the privilege of driving on some of those long roads that went for 150, 200 miles. You didn't see nothing except cactus and sagebrush and desert. and all. But you would see occasionally where a farmer had put up some fences for miles and there's no water out there. And you saw a windmill. And this windmill had a pipe. Had this shaft that went down and there was a pipe that was put into the ground who knows how many hundreds of feet it went. But it found those underground rivers and lakes with millions of gallons of water in it. And then they had the windmill on the top. And when they engaged that thing, when the wind blew, you know, upon the windmill, the windmill began to turn. It began to pump the water. The water just splashed out into these, you know, uh, cattle troughs. They held hundreds of gallons of water. And they weren't, too stingy with it either because then it would have filled up the troughs and it would splash out. And everywhere the water had consistently splashed out, there was beautiful green luscious grasses and plants and trees of all kinds. It had created an oasis because everywhere else there was no water. I think about Jesus being that fountain of living water. But it was the power of the wind that brought the water up and kept all those cows in good health. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit who brings that living water up out of our lives. It's amazing how he will work in us if we will allow him to do so. Let me read you uh, that verse as we continue on here. Uh, and that's in uh, Acts 4, verse 29. It says, And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give your servants great boldness. In their preaching, give us boldness in our preaching. Send your healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, that was a prayer. It says, give your servants boldness, you know, in our preaching. Send your healing power. And, and may miraculous signs and wonders be done. And after this prayer, that was a prayer. After this prayer, their building was shaken. Their, the place where they were meeting, it shook like an earthquake got a hold of it. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they preached God's message with boldness. Their prayers were answered. And they went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. They went around doing 
greater works than Jesus even did. And to be honest with you, in this day and time, there are still miraculous things and wonders taking place even in this day and time. The people being healed and miraculous things happening and prayers being answered still happening today. It has continued on because the Holy Spirit is still being poured out today. You know, Jesus never ministered until he had received the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you knew this or not, but Jesus never worked a miracle until he was 30 years old. And that's when, you remember he was baptized in water? John the Baptist baptized Jesus and he was in the water. A voice from the heavens, God the Father said, this is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. And there's Jesus, the son of God. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus. So we saw the Trinity portrayed very clearly right there. And then as soon as he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit and power, the Holy Spirit brings power. The Holy Spirit, the word of God is strong and heavy to keep my notes in place. The Holy Spirit empowered Jesus. And the scripture says that the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus never performed a miracle until after the Holy Spirit had come upon him as a prototype to show us how to do it our own selves. Now, we don't have to wait till we're 30. That was the law back in those days. You couldn't be a minister until you were 30. That was the way, and, and God came and fulfilled that, you know. If you could feel the power of the Holy Spirit enabling you to do what he created you to do. Many of you have felt the resistance trying to do something you know you shouldn't be doing and it's like, oh man, it's just this resistance. And that's where we, we repent, which means to turn around and you surrender and yield your life to God. You hoist the mainsail, you catch the wind of God as he empowers you to do what he's created you to do. In the book of Galatians chapter six, verse seven, it says, don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. You will always, what's that? Always reap what you sow. If you sow corn, you're gonna reap corn. If you sow watermelon seeds, you're gonna reap watermelons. If you sow tomatoes, you're going to reap tomatoes. If you to sow to the Spirit, you will reap from the Spirit. If you sow criticism and judgment and, and evil, you're going to reap those same things. And the only thing we can get past in that is if we've sown a bad seed and we come to God and we repent and confess our sins to God and we, we pray for a crop failure on all the bad seeds. And, and, and that can happen. He can help us with that. But he's telling us here, don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. You will always reap what you sow. Verse 8 says, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful desires will harvest the consequences of decay and death. But those who live to please the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will, will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So don't get tired of doing what is good. And the Holy Spirit will empower us. Don't get tired of doing what's good. Don't get discouraged and give up. For we will reap a harvest of blessing at the appropriate time. An elderly carpenter was ready to retire. He told his employer, who was a building contractor, of his plans to leave the house building business. And to live a more leisurely life with his wife enjoying his extended family. He would miss the paycheck, but he needed to retire. They could get by. His employer was sorry to see his good worker go, and he asked if he could build just one more house as a personal favor. The carpenter said yes, but it was easy to see that his heart was no longer in his work. He had lost his enthusiasm and had resorted to shoddy workmanship and he used inferior materials. Save a little money there. 
It was an unfortunate, an unfortunate way to end his career. When the carpenter finished his work and his boss came to inspect the new house, the contractor handed the front door key to the carpenter and he said, this is your house. My gift to you. Oh, wow. What a shock. What a shame. If he had only known he was building his own house, he would have done it all so differently. Now he had to live in the home that he had built none too well. So it is with us. We build our lives in a distracted way, reacting rather than acting, willing to put up less than the best. At important points, we do not give the job our best effort. Then with a shock, we look at the situation we have created and find that we're now living in the house we have built for ourselves. If we had only realized, we would have done it differently. Think about that. How does this relate to you? What you're doing. The Bible tells us to do our work as unto the Lord. What are you doing? You realize that what we're doing, we're going to reap the benefit or the consequences of that. And even though you feel like, well, I just can't get this done, I can't do that, the Holy Spirit will empower us with explosive, constructive power to get her done because it affects us far more than we realize. In the words of T.C. Horton, co-founder of Biola College, he said, you can measure what you would do for the Lord by what you do. That's kind of common sense. You would not believe in the last 39, almost 40 years, how many people have come to this altar and asked for prayer. And you wouldn't believe how many have come to ask for the same prayer. And they say, Pastor Ron, would you please pray for me that I would win the lottery? I'm not teasing. And along with that prayer, almost every time it was like, Pastor Ron, if I win the lottery, I'll start tithing, I'll start giving offerings, and I will help the church and help your, the kids that you're sponsoring overseas and all. So pray for me that I'll win the lottery. Well, I would ask God, I say, the Bible says if you'll delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. And that was my prayer. But I come to the conclusion early on that the question I asked him, I said, well, do you tithe now? No. Do you give now? No. Well, guess what? If you don't tithe now, chances of you tithing just because you won the lottery are kind of slim to none. Let me read to you what T.C. Horton said. You can measure what you would do for God by what you do. Now, we'll surrender, genuinely surrender our life to God. And, and we have did an about face. We've repented of our sins and resisting the Holy Spirit. And we stand before him and we hoist the mainsail and we surrender to him. Now he empowers us to do what he created us to do. It's so important that we grasp that, to let him push us, you know, where he has created us to be. I read about a physically powerful but dim-witted farmhand named Lim who lived in a Vermont, Vermont Valley. His mother resented him from the day he was born and she often ridiculed him with harsh and demeaning words. Even so, the boy served her until she died. Lim was the target of village jokes. But one night, he came upon a huge dog killing some farmer's sheep. And using his bare hands as his only weapon, he strangled the dog to death. When the morning came and the villagers discovered that the dog was really a giant timber wolf, Lim quickly earned the villagers' silent admiration. Later on, an unwed village girl falsely accused Lim of being the father of her baby. Even though he was innocent, he married the girl so the baby would have a father. Unfortunately, the mother died within a year, so Lim raised the little girl. After she was grown and married, 
her own baby became desperately ill and Lim sold all of his sheep to pay for the baby's medical care. Confronted with meanness, misunderstanding and loneliness all of his life, Lim had no recourse in professing the true nature of his own life other than to live it out and serving others. And that he did. The loudest message you will ever speak is your life. Is your life. You'll speak so loud by how you live. People can say this and do that and we don't have to fight and retaliate. Just live your life. Live your life and live it good. Greatness is not discovered in trying to be somebody. That's not greatness. A lot of people are always trying to be somebody. Greatness is discovered by trying to help somebody. When you begin to serve and you touch other people's lives, that's greatness. Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 says, Jesus is speaking. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it useful again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. And then Jesus, who is the light of the world, he says, you are the light. You are the light of the world. He said, Jesus says, like a city on a mountain, glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light under a basket. Instead, put it on a lampstand and let it shine for all. And we might ask our question, how can we do that? And then he explains that in verse 16. He says, in the same way that you light a light and you put it on a stand, in the same way, let your good deeds, your good deeds shine out for all to see. When people see your good deeds, they're seeing the light. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. People see your good works, Jesus said, and people will praise your heavenly father as a result of seeing you serving and touching other people's lives. It shines out ever so brightly. So let's assist in the things that we need to assist with. And let's resist the things we need to resist by the power of the Holy Spirit who will empower us if we'll hoist the mainsail and yield our lives to him. He was not too well educated and his manner was somewhat crude. He was a rough kind of guy, but he became a Christian and was on fire for the Lord. He constantly pestered his pastor to help him be a good, genuine service, be of good, genuine service to his church. In desperation, the pastor finally gave him a list of 10 people saying, these are members who seldom attend services anymore. Some are prominent men of the city. Contact them any way you can and try to get them to be more faithful. Use the church stationery to write letters if you want, but get them back into church. He accepted the challenge with enthusiasm. About three weeks later, a letter arrived from a prominent physician whose name was on the list. In the envelope was a $1,000 check and a note. Dear pastor, enclosed is my check to make up for my miss offerings and tithe. I'm sorry for missing worship so much, but be assured I am going to be present every Sunday from now on and will not by choice miss services again. Sincerely, M.B. Jones, M.D. P.S. Would you kindly tell your secretary that there is only one T in dirty and no C in skunk? Apparently this gentleman the ruffian used the word dirty skunk when he was encouraging this guy to give back to church, apparently. Now, people need a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ before they can minister to other people, but that's about the only qualification you need. And God will use you if your normal conversation includes dirty skunk. If, if you speak a little bit different or act a little bit different, God can use every man, woman, boy, and girl when empowered by his spirit. And I, I, I find that amazing. That's 
The only reason I'm here today, to be honest with you, and I don't call too many people a dirty skunk anymore myself, but I'm not quite as refined as a pastor as you deserve, maybe, you know. But God says he delights and he uses the foolish and the weak things of the world, does he not? To confound the wise. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, God saved you by his special favor when you believed. And you can't take the credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done or that, we've, yeah, that we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece and he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We are, we are saved to serve, but we are not saved by serving. When we are saved, we'll want to serve, especially when we're empowered by the Holy Spirit that Christ has sent to us. But we're not saved by the works that we do. The works that we do are byproducts of the transformation that Christ has made in our lives. <coughs> Mark chapter 9, verse 35 says, He sat down, Jesus sat down, and he called the 12 disciples over to him, and then he said, Anyone who wants to be first. Me first, me first. Anyone who wants to be first must take, take what? Last place. You first, then me. And be the servant of everyone else. You want to be first? You, you take the last position and you have to have a passion to serve everybody else around you. Matthew 23, verse 11 says, The greatest among you must be what? A servant. And he gives us the power to serve. You see that sailboat there? Imagine how powerful that sailboat is when the wind has captured all those sails and has filled all those sails. It's amazing the power when we surrender and we yield ourselves to Almighty God. And nothing that's worth keeping will ever be lost when you surrender and yield yourself to God. Let me turn this off for just a moment here as we kind of come to a close. <clears throat> when Dawson Trotman passed on, he died, he probably left a legacy of discipleship on the earth that will never be matched except perhaps in the life of Jesus Christ himself. Uh, Dawson Trotman was the inspiration. He was the founder of, of uh, Navigators, which is a phenomenal method of studying the Bible and discipleship. Phenomenal. The guy who wrote the article says, I've become a real student of Dawson Trotman and believe wholeheartedly in the methods of discipleship that he taught and emulated throughout his days. He died in Shroon Lake, New York. He died of all things in the midst of an area that he was an expert in. He drowned. He was an expert swimmer. In the last few moments of his life that he had in the water, he lifted one girl out of the water, two girls fell in the water without life jackets and they didn't come up. And he dove in and he lifted one girl out of the water and people that was there in a boat nearby grabbed her and poured her in the boat. He went down and got the other girl. Tremendous effort on his own physical body, diving deep and searching for her. And then he lifted her out of the water. And then... He submerged and was not found again until the dragnet found him a few hours later. He exhausted every ounce of oxygen in his lungs. To rescue that girl and put her in the hands of those who was in a boat. A man named Larson was on that boat when Trotman died and he said, the entire United States Navy couldn't have saved Trotman that day. It was just God's time. Time Magazine ran an article on Trotman's life the very next week 
and they put a caption beneath his name and it read, always holding somebody up. Always. In one sentence, that was Trotman's life, his investment in people in honesty and humility, holding them up. Question, are you doing that? It's so easy to pull people down or to say cutting remarks that pull people down, put people in their rightful place, we would say. But see, when the Holy Spirit empowers us, we'll be lifting people up. Like Dawson Trotman did. So there's a question right now. Can you name that person? Who are you holding up? Who are you lifting up? Who are you rescuing? Who are you helping? He has given us his power to serve and to let our light and our good work shine out, to make an eternal impact and difference in this world in which we live. Who are you holding up? Who are you lifting up? And at least if we're not lifting someone up, let's stop pulling them down. <laughs> or, or, or the cutting remarks. We can always find something negative to say about something, can't we? About somebody. I know a lot worse stuff about me than you do, okay? So if you want to say some bad things about me, I can help you. <laughs> you probably know a whole lot worse things about you <laughs> than I know, Right? But what good does that do anybody? What if we invest our time and our energy and we access the power of the Holy Spirit to just lift people up? When they're down, they don't need to be pushed down no deeper. They need somebody to risk their life to hold them up and to rescue them. That's what we need to do, to be honest with you. Well, we got lots more we could talk about, but our time is pretty much out right now. And I'd like to pray for you. So let's bow our heads together. Father, I thank you that you have trusted us to make a difference in this world in which we live. Lord, I know you've put each one of us here for a purpose and each one of us are special. And even the difficulties we have gone through, we've learned much in those times that you can help us use that information to help other people. Bless my brothers and sisters the boys and girls who are in this building and those who watch from afar, wherever they may be or listen, bless each one of us and give us a revelation of your Holy Spirit and power that you send into our lives. Thank you, Father, for the privileges you've given us. We acknowledge that every good thing we have, it is from you. And we are so thankful. And as our heads are bowed, I would ask you to join me to uh, renew your commitment to Christ, to hoist the main sail and let him fill your sail with his Holy Spirit, the wind of his spirit to empower us to do what he created us to do. Now, you may know Christ already, but would you reaffirm your faith in him today? And if you've never hoisted that main sail and you've never surrendered to Christ, would you join us as we pray today and do so? Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that you love me. And that is why you sent your son Jesus. And I believe he died in my place to hold me up, up and out of sin. So I will live with you one day. I do believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And I am so thankful. Work a miracle in me, oh God. So I can begin to hold people up. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And your power. And all the gifts that you have. And deliver me, oh God. From showing off gifts. Help me to use your gifts to lift people up, to change people's lives, to make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name.
Amen. And amen. Thank you.